Okay, welcome back. Wouldn't matter how many times that bell's rung, would it? There's still a few coming in. Um, it's not very often um, that I get the opportunity of making an introduction to someone who has been a personal friend of mine for just about a quarter of a century. We were child brides, of course. Um, when we uh, were putting our speakers' uh, invitations together, we obviously wanted to have an extremely high-profile Australian keynote speaker. And our wish list started with one name, and fortunately, we never had to go to number two or three. Peter Verwer, is the Chief Executive of the Property Council of Australia. It is the nation's leading advocate for the 670 billion investment property industry. As well as pursuing its core business of advocacy and public affairs, the Property Council operates learning, research, publishing and networking businesses. Peter's current political priorities are tax modernisation, sustainability, finance and regulatory reform. Peter is a member of many public and private sector bodies here in Australia. Now I'm going to list some of them and I can assure you this is not the full exhaustive list. He's the chair of Liverpool Housing Australia. He is the Chair of Construction Forecasting Council. He is the Chair of the National Counter-Terrorism Business Advisory Group. He sits on the Australian Statistics Advisory Council. He sits on the Australian Construction Industry Forum. I presume he's an insomniac. He sits on the Australian Sustainable Built Environment Council on the Business Coalition for Tax Reform, the Green Building Council of Australia, and the Investment Property Data Bank. The Property Council, just from his spare time when he's running that, employs 97 people right across Australia and generates revenues of $26 million. The Federal Government has appointed Peter one of six disability community leaders. He's also a Life Fellow of the Green Building Council, an Honorary Fellow of the Australian Institute of Quantity Surveyors, and a Fellow of the Royal Institution of Chartered Surveyors. It is with enormous pleasure I introduce Mr. Peter Verla. Thank you, John, for that uh, very generous uh, obituary. Uh, in case you didn't know, we're in the, the, the session called Delivering the Urban uh, Century because the organisers wanted me to give a, a big picture view of some of the key themes of this event. I'm going to start off by giving you the thesis so that you can disagree with me straight away. Uh, and that is that we're living in an age of urban acceleration that the globe has never seen this scale or extent of urbanization. And that's almost a given these days. And you can see it from the, this uh, nighttime map of the world. But we also live in an epoch of accelerating global innovation driven by the rapid proliferation of communication technology in a connected way and connecting up the planet. And it's my thesis that it's the intersection of these drivers which are really accelerators, uh, the urbanization, the information technology uh, innovation uh, in a globalized way, which is a cause of tremendous optimism about the future. And this is particularly relevant for the people in the room because you are the stewards 
of the built environment, or what I prefer to call the human environment. That is to say that you design and you deliver and you manage the built environment. In fact, you are a key think tank, and this entity is a key think tank, uh, in relation to how we can become far more innovative and how we can unleash prosperity uh, on the planet. One of the emerging ideas of the last decade has been about urban economics, a topic shunned by most economists for over a century, even ignoring the works of Alfred Marshall. And it's the intersection of these three factors that are on your screen which provide an opportunity for us to build in an exponential way prosperity by making an investment in urban economics. And the reason that's so important to the people in the, in the room is that you are pretty much in charge of that. You're in charge of the opportunity to better design and build the kit of the built environment, connect it up, the buildings to the precincts, to the cities, the metropolises, to the regions, and by doing so, supercharge productivity and thereby underpin prosperity. Urban economists now say that the potential, the dividend from designing, investing in cities, designing them better and managing them, managing them better is about 2 to 8% lift in GDP, which is an enormous amount. A recent study in the UK showed that just a 10% increase in, in connectivity, what economists like to call agglomeration, so really the extent to which businesses and people uh, can transfer ideas and work with each other, a 10% lift in agglomeration of connectivity actually provides a one and a quarter percent bump uh, in GDP. So the GDP and the economic activity, which actually fund, which underpin uh, livability. So in many ways, that opportunity is in your hands because you're at the crossroads of the built environment, the virtual environment, the political environment, the public policy environment. And the people that the Property Council represents are the investors uh, in that arena. And the other key factor in thinking about this opportunity is that 60% of the built environment that we're going to need by 2050, 60%, this is according to the World Bank, doesn't exist yet. Now, we hear from one of our speakers later who wants to talk about what do we do with the existing stock. You know, we've got a lot to build, but we've also got assets which we may need to make work harder, and how do we do that? In Australia, for instance, there's 360 million square metres of built stock, which is more than 25, year old, 25 years old, and that doesn't include houses. How do we make that stock sweat harder and work harder for us? How do we unleash productivity from that, as well as build the cities which don't yet exist. So I'm going to make four points about this unleashing that can occur from the intersection of the drivers. Firstly, that the opportunity is to provide, to ex accelerate community well-being. So when I talk about productivity, I am principally referring to economic ac productivity and economic activity, but I also mean the unleashing of social capital as well. So we can raise well-being, we can bo boost productivity, but a fundamental thesis of this presentation is also that cities will save the planet, that by better designing our cities, not just as individual components that don't talk to each other, but in an integrated way, and I asked the panel what that means, because there are two words which really scare me. Integration, which is becoming a sort of mantra, you know, if we just take an integrated design approach to things, uh, then we're going to get better buildings. And the other one is holistic. Right? These two words are probably going to be used more than 10,000 times during this Congress. And then they'll be followed by this but. But why, people, why don't people understand and why don't they actually change their practices? And what we're going to explore in the panel is to look at the barriers uh, to these blockages which block urban productivity and therefore improvements in productivity. But one of the great dividends of getting that right is that cities will be completely redesigned uh, in a way which is actually planet friendly, high performance green buildings, or as one of the people I'm going to cite, a sort of a blue technology. 
And fourthly, and probably most interestingly, is that this urbanized, massively, intensively connected uh, planet uh, is also one which radically changes the nature of civic society. That is to say that individuals will be more empowered, they'll have greater control over their lives, and so they'll be able to make the most in a way which has never occurred before in society of their own talents, their own talents uh, and their experiences and their aspirations. So the issue then becomes, are our political systems, our public policy systems and our business models fit for purpose for this challenge to which the answer is no? The bigger question is how can we shift them so that we can actually take, take hold of this you know, potential unleashing of a globalised, urbanised, uh, a connected world. So technology and aspiration are currently running ahead of our institutional arrangements uh, within society. And this is particularly the case, I put to you, in our area, in the built environment area. Uh, we already heard a, a sort of a, a, a cry for help this morning, which is why don't the, the various stakeholders understand the opportunities that technologies provide and simply apply them? And the answer is, I think, that because they're not well sold. Because the language, you know, moving from a language of technology to a language of business is something which is very poorly done. So let's take a look at these accelerators uh, and then we'll bring our panel up for, for the hard stuff and I really encourage a lot of uh, questions. So we want to be as controversial as possible. We want to have a full and frank debate. Uh, uh, I'm not talking about a Jerry Springer uh, style event, but as soon as you've got a question, if you go up to those microphones, up in my speech, uh, then what we'll do is get you involved in the, in the fray here. So let's just look a bit more at what global urbanization uh, really means. These are just the covers of two books uh, put together by the Urban Age Project, a fantastic uh, 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 endeavor run by the London School of Economics. And they make clear the nature of this radical change. 1900, there are only 10% of people in cities. Uh, by 2007, it was 50%. It's currently just on 53, 54%. But more importantly, uh, what we're going to see by 2050 is that 75% of people will live in cities, that p people will live close to each other. And the question is, will they live in smart cities or will they live in dumb cities? Will there be smart growth or will there be dumb growth? There's only one graph in this entire presentation. I've made it as big as possible. But it's, these are an important numbers because in 1950, 40% of the urbanized world was in the so-called developing countries. Uh, and if you look at the top of the, the bar chart, that's going to be nearly double. It's nearly going to be nearly double uh, uh, in 2030. 80% of people will live in these urban nations. So if we get it wrong, we're going to get it massively wrong as well. But it's also why the opportunity is so uh, fierce. For rock star economists uh, like Ed Glaser, he says that cities are the greatest uh, invention of humanity. Indeed, he goes on to say that this invention makes us smarter, uh, richer, smarter, greener, healthier and happier. I mean, you had us at hello on that one. <laughs> and his main argument, uh, really, is the one about urban productivity. What draws people to cities is a very smart calculus it's a diversification strategy, firstly, so that they know that they've got an oppo multiple opportunities to gain access to capital. They have multiple opportunities to find friends, life partners, multiple opportunities to come close to their, their customers. And if all of that fails, then they can try again because they're in a diverse, uh, uh, myriad environment. He also says that there's a, a central paradox uh, to the modern metropolis. And that is, as the cost of connecting across uh, cities and across countries declines, then the value of being close increases. And that's an argument to make sure that the, the places that comprise cities are themselves uh, unleashing of, uh, of, of uh, aspiration and culture 
uh, uh, the people's sights are raised. I want to talk a bit about digital technology, and I'm going to make three points uh, here. And the first is that information is intrinsically global now, and you know this is a classic Facebook map. So these are the localities of friendships. This is the social connectivity of Facebook friends. Who here is on Facebook? Who here is on the boring person's Facebook, LinkedIn? Okay. It'd be interesting to see the LinkedIn uh, uh, map here. But this isn't the Facebook connectivity which has been overlaid on a map of the world. This is the actual links between Facebook friends using GPS, and you notice it forms the world. And this would be even starker uh, if we added in QZone with China, which is the Facebook of China, which has 552 uh, million people, and the contact uh, in Russia, which has another 192 uh, million people. But the whole point here is that the acceleration of this uh, connectivity will unleash more and more innovation when instead of just having about 2 billion people uh, connecting uh, to each other, often at very poor speeds, we have 7 billion and then ultimately 9 billion. And this radically changes the nature of society. Radically changes it. The Nobel laureate, uh, Robert Lucas Jr., said that there's, there's a right, we're entering into a new class-based society and the new class of people are those who are ideas generating and problem solving. In other words, we're moving thinking and problem solving away from the cottage industry that it has been for several centuries. And this is radically more different than the invention of the, the two-way telephone in 1876 or even the early uh, internet of the 1990s because these are people who are being given the tools to actually share their ideas. Now, uh, if we go to a couple of other thinkers who I think are worth uh, having a look at, so the executive chairman of Google and the director of Google Ideas, Eric Smith and Jared Cohen, uh, they say in this excellent book, The New Digital Age, uh, that we are, you know, just to underline the point because People, I think, are starting to take urbanisation for granted and they're taking technological change for granted, but they are saying that we're facing a brave new world, the most fast-paced and exciting period in human history. We'll experience more change at a quicker rate than any previous generation, and this change, driven in part by the devices in our own hands, will be more personal and participatory than we can imagine. They give the example of a Congolese uh, fisherwoman so, you know, it's not just about the sorts of mega projects that we've been talking about this at this Congress, but the idea that you can unleash another, another mind uh, and that people can create their own networks and that you can get a six degree of separation planet down to two degrees uh, of, of, of commerce uh, and cultural interaction, uh, I, I think is displayed by this simple anecdote that they provided about a Congolese a fisherwoman. So Congolese women tended to uh, uh, put their fishing lines in, they got their catch for the day, uh, they put it in one place, they guessed how much was needed, uh, and they put it into uh, expensive refrigeration units using energy very inefficiently. They often needed to have security guards so that the catch wasn't taken. Now, not using the technology in this room, but very basic mobile uh, technology. These Congolese fish and fisherwomen uh, have created a totally new economic system for themselves. Firstly, they leave the fish on the lines in the river. They wait for the orders to come in, which they towed up. They then pull in the fish that are needed, thereby ensuring that they're fresh. And they also connect up, that is to say, create economic co-ops with other villagers in order to ensure that what they're doing is supplying the needs of the customers. So this is A, more uh, efficient from an environmental perspective, it's more energy efficient. Uh, it means that uh, there's less food poisoning, the, the fish are better, uh, and that these uh, women are also create an economic micro system which is far more efficient. And they're doing that with a telephone. They're doing that with a telephone. It's not even an app, the app will be created. 
So the conclusion uh, of the Google boys is that evolution is building on its own increasing order. And this is my point about when you have multiple accelerations, uh, then you're going to get greater returns faster over time. So let's look at another aspect of this uh, technology. I'm not going to go into this in huge detail because there's a large number of really quite good presentations on artificial intelligence, uh, machine thinking, telematics uh, at this, this com uh, robotics uh, at this conference. But the gap between the sort of technology that's available today uh, and what we see with artificial uh, intelligence and the systems, for instance, machine thinking is already been used in Australia to make assessments about the pipes that have been laid, the water pipes uh, under some of the cities. So instead of taking an incredibly inefficient way of you know, digging down, finding the pipe, having a look at uh, testing all the leaking, uh, what they're doing is using machine logic to determine when those pipes were laid, uh, the sort of materials which were used for those pipes to monitor the leakage and therefore optimise the maintenance of those, those pipes. And as you know, the, the invisible infrastructure in cities is as expensive to maintain. Well, it's a multiple uh, of the original construction cost and it's usually very, very poorly done. This is something that artificial uh, intelligence can remedy. But the other uh, issue about artificial intelligence is, is gaming. More money, I mean, there's more technology in one 16-year-old's Xbox than there is in the entire planning system of Australia. You know, if it was up to me, I would take Australia's planning system with all of its regulation, with all of its metro strategies, uh, you know, which are all basically paper box, and I'd give it to Pixar or the people who did Happy Feet. Because the revolution, if you talk, talk to a company like Urban Circus, uh, for instance, uh, who create 3D models, in fact, they're 4D because they have time, uh, of all of, the, of, all of the, the cities, and you apply that technology to something like community consultation, instead of having time-wasting charrettes with lots of butcher's paper, you can actually ask people what they think about you know, you can immerse them into multiple scenarios about what their, what their cities, their precincts, their towns should look like. And what they've said is in Melbourne, where they've tried this, that it got the consultation period down from nine months to 45 minutes. Because people could see it. They could see the alternatives. Uh, and also when they've had quite feisty people at community consultations who didn't like the idea of a massive bypass going through their home, you know, they march into that room, uh, into that hall, uh, and instead of having the, the, the biscuits and the, the, the brownies and, you know, all of the diagrams which nobody can understand, they put them in to a future scenario of what their locale would look like. And firstly, you have a whole bunch of people going, you know what, I still don't like it, but it's not as bad as I thought it was. It wasn't the horror because, it, you know, it's the visualisation of the future. This is what gaming technology provides. And then you have a whole bunch of other people say, you know what, I've got some ideas about this. I've got some ideas about, you know, how we can connect this up to the local community. And that's a radical change. And what we saw in uh, London during the Olympics, that for not much money, for not mega sophisticated telematics, the sorts of things you're talking about at this uh, conference, they managed to get what was a pretty poor system, uh, you know, a legacy infrastructure network to operate really efficiently. And what was the secret of that? It wasn't just the technological smarts and the connecting up, creating a common language uh, of connectivity between a whole bunch of legacy systems. It was that they created a totally open source system and that groups with information from the public and private sector could actually share. And we see in Chicago now where uh, the, the, the mayor has committed to creating an open source system and you look at the Chicago portal, you can get everything from snow clearing rates KPI against KPIs uh, through to information about how the medical systems uh, operate. So, you know, from uh, s sanitary stuff all the way to education uh, and, and health systems. And people take that information. I had a look at it. It's, you know, pretty boring. <laughs> but then people go and turn that into apps. And this is what happens when you create an open source society. And gaming technology is one part of that. You know, a game like Halo uh, costs about 
thirty bill, uh, thirty million dollars to develop. Thirty million dollars. I haven't seen thirty million dollars being allocated to planning uh, uh, improvements in Australia. All those people from other countries, you can tell me whether your governments invest more. Uh, the science fiction uh, part of this is also interesting. Uh, once again, I won't spend a lot of time on it uh, because you know it's really happening now, and there are very there are several presentations which are going into uh, this. But photonics, nanotechnology, biomimicry. Uh, when you look at some of the stuff that's happening now uh, with micro uh, uh, algae, bioadaptive mechanisms, whereby you know you have algae. Uh, uh, which can become uh, an insulator and can also be used uh, to generate energy uh, in nano, you know, nanopores, nanotubes, you know, this stuff that, that works right now. I mean, there'll be some people in the audience going, oh my God, you're so far behind the times. <laughs> We've already got beyond that. But the idea of creating cement and steel, which is stronger and less prone to cracking, those technologies uh, already exist and are incredibly exciting. So the issue here really, uh, oh, I'll just mention one more thing, uh, and that is the reason it seems to be a challenge is if you, if you take something like BIM uh, or uh, uh, unitized, unitized building, so the, uh, if, if you look at that bottom uh, picture there, that's uh, the Forte uh, building. It's a timber building, it's a 10-story timber building uh, in Melbourne. It was meant to take 52 weeks. Uh, it's a land lease led project. 52 weeks down to 40 weeks. But not only that, it's a much safer site as well, uh, and it's a greener building. Uh, in fact, I think the number is that uh, there's about 14 megatons of, uh, of abatement over the life cycle of that, of that building. If you look at the uh, 338 uh, metre uh, uh, Australia 108 structure that Katsalidis uh, partners, Fender Katsalidis are, are building at the moment, so their reckoning is that they're going to be able to, because they're using off-site structural assembly, they're going to be able to get that thing up uh, 30 to 40 percent faster with a 15 to 20 percent reduction in construction costs. My first question to the panel is going to be, is it true that there's the potential to mainstream a reduction in construction costs by about 30 percent while also maintaining high performance, securing high performance buildings? and safe work sites. People like Katsalidi say this can be done now. Uh, 3D printing, or what uh, the experts call additive manufacturing, that top, that picture there, right, that's 3D, that, is, that bike is printed. That is a printed bike. Now, it's a big printer. But what they've done is they've created a 3D bike. It doesn't work, but it is a replica uh, and this is really what the Google boys are saying, which is to say that by doing more in the virtual world, then the mechanical efficiency of the, of the physical world is massively improved. And that is to say that value creation uh, is also supercharged. So, the future is already here. It's just not widely uh, distributed. All of these ideas have been uh, tested. This is a quote from William Gibson. And that we have these sort of tentative, and this is how science has already operated, these tentative outreachings into society. The accelerator that I talked about before of a massively uh, globally connected world where innovation is unleashed, unleashed means that we can speed up that old cottage industry approach uh, to getting innovation uh, to market. And because we're actually talking about urban technology, that happens at scale, uh, and therefore the benefits are massive across the planet. One other thing on, on technology, this guy, Gunter Pauli, uh, very interesting chap, we had him out uh, earlier this year. You know, he doesn't like all this green stuff. He thinks green is old fashioned. Forget green, he wants to go to blue. So what he's really saying is that the, the credo of the sort of environmental uh, advances that we've had over the last 10 years, which have been, been huge. I mean, there's no institutional building in Australia that's not five or six star. To do so would be to build an obsolete building. But he's saying, look, we can do much, much better than that. We can even do better than building 57 apartments in 11 days. I'm going to show you a video about that later. We can do better than unitization. 
What he wants to do is in 10 years, there will be 100 market-ready innovations that create 100 million jobs and that it's all green, it's all zero uh, carbon. So this guy is a Belgian economist and entrepreneur. I mean, he's a real uh, uh, doer. And in going beyond this sort of less in but sort of more out eco-efficiency uh, creed, what he's really saying is that I don't want one coffee bean to produce, you know, one hundredth of a cup of coffee. I want that coffee bean to be used for multiple purposes. Um, and in fact, I want that coffee bean waste to be taken so that it can used for, be used for bean farming. And all of his innovations that he's talked about relate to energy production and mining uh, and banking uh, and medicine. From making biodegradable detergents from citrus peels to converting all of the existing petrol or gas stations uh, into battery charging packs uh, for electric cars. My final point on uh, technology is to, is to say something uh, obvious, I suppose, uh, but it's okay because the Greeks said it first and they used to get everything right. Uh, and that technology, techne, is not just the, the tools, it's the know-how as well. That's what real technology is. Uh, and my main point here is that infrastructure is technology uh, and that by better designing our cities and investing in technology, remedying infrastructure deficits, what we're actually doing is hardwiring in, hardwiring in a, a, a new circuit board. We're used to thinking of technology uh, infrastructure as these big kits of roads and airports and harbour works. But it's the micro-urban technology that deals with pinch points that connects up the, the, the education systems, the health systems, the childcare systems to jobs. This is probably the big new focus of the future uh, and that we need fit for purpose planning systems uh, to do that. Because the, the, the physical worlds and the virtual worlds collide in our sphere, the built environment sphere, sphere the human uh, sphere. So there's a whole stack of um, quite difficult issues that this raises and praise the Lord we have three people who can actually answer all of these questions. Uh, so I'm going to ask uh, Michael Roche, uh, Graham Newton uh, and Peter Berghout to come up to the stage. Uh, please why don't you give them a welcome.